Kosovo is a disputed territory and partially recognized state in Southeast Europe that declared independence from Serbia in February 2008 as the Republic of Kosovo. Serbia refuses to recognize Kosovo as a state, although with the Brussels Agreement of 2013, it accepted the legitimacy of Kosovo institutions. Kosovo is currently living some of the worst political unrest since it declared independence. The country suffers from increasing unemployment, with 61% of its youth out of work, while the country is ranked 103rd in the Corruption Perceptions Index, a standard basing its findings on how corrupt a country is perceived. How is this situation being contested by the public and how does it relate to other dynamics in the region? Deputetve nuk e kanë deklaru pasunin, ata mora ati në qeveri shkarin, ata nuk e kanë venin në qeveri. Nuk e di, me ndesë se posë, sepse i gjithashtu edhe ajo Shqipërisë, me ndjetën, si do mos tjerë kërë Shqipëria, që është me hapa më përpara, kjo e Kosovës është me kohë e korruptuar. Qëre e ndë robri, 20 vjeshtë kohë, 20 vjeshtë Evropa e ndë Kosova robri dhe zezë. Kur do të më ndryshu? Qa do të më bëhë bëhë? Do opëdi do të më zhumë protesta. Potresht, protesta, veç protesta, s'ka të të rrugë dalë. Welcome to Talk Real here in Prizren, Kosovo. I'm joined around this table by Una Hidari, who's a journalist here in Kosovo, by Ron Ginobsi, who's an activist, Darko Sikovic from the foundation Doku Kino, who's a social entrepreneur and a communicator, and Sidem Sidamli from the Northern Forest Defense, uh, an activist in Turkey. Um, Una, I wanted to start with you um, on this topic of corruption uh, to maybe set a little bit the context uh, here in Kosovo when it comes to um, recent uh, corruption scandals and maybe also a little bit how that's been perceived by the population. Um, well, Kosovo has, al although all Western Balkan countries after the fall of Yugoslavia have gone through different political changes, Kosovo has definitely seen the most radical ones. Um, um, it spent a good eight, nine years after the conflict here being a UN protectorate and then declaring independence in 2008, which is when they, uh, the real political institutions in Kosovo were, trying, were, were supposed to be set up. But what happened most of the time, and this is the perception not only amongst journalists who cover corruption cases, but even the, the, the general population, is that certain cases of corruption, which often start and exist even at the very top levels of government, have been uh, sort of set to the side or overstepped by people, uh, by both the judiciary and by uh, the international community, which is overseen uh, during the UN protectorate period, been directly involved, and then after 2008 being more of an overseer monitor of the situation here, have been set to the side uh, for the greater cause of stability in the country. Um, what has happened is that most top officials, for which, where, where they're, um, which are involved in corruptive scandals, and this, where this is quite evident, um, have not seen justice and not faced justice because they have in some form been involved in the political um, either coalitions or process in Kosovo that were uh, ma uh, ma aimed at um, making the situa situation here as stable as possible, uh, be it um, with regard to inter-ethnic issues between the Albanian and the Serbian community or just setting up the new institutions after as Kosovo uh, proceeds in its statehood. Um, this has created a spirit of impunity a belief that um, uh, amongst most 
most uh, officials, be it those who were in power right after the conflict and those who, who now um, have come to power, that certain things will be tolerated and certain things won't be, uh, won't be uh, penalized by the judiciary or other institutions because of the fact that um, there's a greater cause of stability to be taken into consideration. And this is why people here, from my experience as a journalist on the field, talking to them and covering other corruptive scandals are quite um, un, they, they don't definitely don't think that the, these cases will be seen through with the people who are making their lives in Kosovo less efficient, um, making policies unimplementable will be will be will face face um, uh, trial or other forms of penalization for it. Ron, maybe coming to you because you've been quite heavily involved in trying to mobilize people around these issues and other political issues uh, in Kosovo. It would be interesting to hear. Um, what successes we've had in terms of mobilizing people and maybe a little bit the um, social and ideological profile of uh, people who've been most concerned or active around these issues of corruption. Um, during the uh, last four, three years, we had some initiatives when it comes to, uh, you know, uh, bringing together different elements of society and trying to uh, raise a voice of citizens and trying to, you know, fight cor corruption, impunity, and these forms of, uh, as we now refer in Kosovo, state capture. Uh, this, I mean, we had some small victories uh, with in different examples. Uh, we reached like two resigns uh, from uh, different. Uh, sectors, for example, one is the rector of University of Pristina, which is a public university. Uh, he published in a, a fake journal in order to get advanced in academic life, and he uh, resigned because of the protest, which at some point became violent from the police side. And we also had these small successes uh, with the um, protestoi uh, event, we had like 15 protests uh, under the hashtag protestoi, which is uh, the same hashtag that uh, activists are using in Skopje. We did that on purpose in order to try to regionalize issues that we see that are very common in every uh, uh, state of Balkans. Wiretaps that leaked uh, from a uh, it, it was all, uh, it had in center uh, an official from the ruling party who was appointing people in different institutions from his family or the others. And <clears throat> we, uh, uh, we were shocked as a public. Of course, we knew that these kind of things happened, but not with that kind of language. And, you know, and it, it was very powerful in the beginning. Uh, the thing is that in Kosovo, we have this problem of being in a process of transition and state building, which nobody can say exactly what it means. For example, in Protestoi, uh, it is interesting to see that there are the, the core group, the core group of organizers was a uh, whole with uh, people that are employed, that have good salaries for Kosovo context. So, uh, and it, it was isolated event only in Pristina. Uh, this talks a lot uh, about our way of organizing as left activists. Uh, it talks about our power of la or lack of power. And uh, it talks also about the situation in Kosovo that uh, can, uh, can put people on streets with thousands of them for some symbolic issues such as flag, uh, anti-dialogue or demarcation, things that are totally abstract, while when we try to fight on the ground for real things, we don't seem to be that powerful as uh, putting thousands in the streets. This would be like... Thank you. <clears throat> Darko, you're, you're living between Belgrade and Sarajevo, if I understand right. And in Belgrade, there's been the, the waterfront protests, which have got some media attention across, across Europe. But I, I understand you're traveling quite a lot around the region in general. And it would be interesting 
because of that, to hear your perspective on whether uh, you see a coming awareness of these issues of corruption, maybe a move away from uh, previous national or ethnic com conflicts towards uh, awareness of other kinds of political issues. How, how do you see it? What's your feeling from the region? I would second to what Uda said for Kos Kosovo. I would, um, I would argue that it, it works for every country um, in the Balkans, especially the ones that came after Yugoslavia. I mean, we're all in a process of state building, and it's true. I mean, somewhere it's more obvious and more formal and formalized and said, like in Kosovo, but also in Serbia. It doesn't matter the history, how long the history of statehood is. There is fundamental lack of um, key democratic institutions. So the, the societies are being governed through political elites or more commonly through um, a single leader or a number of them without um, having due diligence of involving people except for the elections. And even the um, legitimacy and the legality of those elections across the region is questionable. Just look at Montenegro, just look at what happens in, um, in Bosnia with many, uh, with many things, m many places where, where people need to say their mind. Either it's uh, elections, either it's uh, census, either it's referendum. I mean, those all are really very dubious um, uh, instances of how citizens participate. And what I think and what I see across the region, that there is this conscious uh, across the political spectrum, uh, especially of young people um, coming from different walks of life, that they do understand that there is no state without institutions to back it. So, for example, in Belgrade, yes, there was this Belgrade waterfront development issue where, very briefly, the state has taken a huge um, section of centrally placed land, downtown Belgrade, and gave it away to um, Arab private inve investors. R right, so we're in a ridiculous situation where we are, we are building a shopping mall there and it's state-backed project. Like the state is building a, the biggest shopping mall in the Balkans. But mm -hmm. that aside, that aside, I mean, uh, there was a movement trying to contest that, trying to get citizens involved in the, in the issue. But um, only after the state has pulled down some of the buildings in the middle of the night without any uh, legal procedure, they just came, it, it isn't even known whether it's the state. It's some unknown people uh, with parkas came and tore down a number of buildings only then did that um, cross, let's say, the political line and manage to gather um, a larger mass of people. They actually, or better said, we actually walked um, downtown Belgrade a dozen of times to express uh, that we can't live in a state where you call police to protect you from unknown um, invaders, right? Um, and police hangs up on you. That cannot be the case. You can agree or, can, or, or you don't agree with the waterfront development and how it's done. But you know, when it comes to basic institution, like when I'm in danger, I call the police expecting it to protect me, then you know, it's not a space for debate. That happens across the region. Sidem, you've been, you've been traveling uh, with us in the Balkans for a couple of days now in Macedonia, now here in Kosovo. Um, you were quite involved in, in Gezi Park, in different movements in, in Turkey. Are some of the things that you're hearing familiar? Um, you know, how, how familiar does it look to what's been going on it, in Turkey? I was surprised how familiar it looked because, I mean, I think the general context, uh, both in Turkey and maybe in Balkan countries, which created this corruption at the daily level and at the top level of the political structure is some Maybe we can now, we, we are living in Turkey now uh, for 30 years in a context of neoliberalism in terms of deregulation, financialization, and, you know, top bottom uh, competition of people for jobs and for the cities to be, you know, the, I mean, uh, some attraction centers. So uh, we were actually very much accustomed to live this uh, in our daily lives. 
uh, which is accompanied by a kind of, you know, uh, crony capitalism, which means that, I mean, the government parties at the same time is the center of the whole uh, business interests. And but. Uh, of course, after Gezi Park, uh, we experienced a really important uh, uh, experience in terms of this because uh, actually, uh, you know, this uh, the Gezi Revolt, uh, we call it as Haziran Revolt, June Revolt. Uh, it also um, it happened in a context of a very big political polarization and when the people tried to defend their uh, uh, basic social rights and the cities and the natural resources and what uh, at the same time what was living uh, being lived in Turkey was that this governing party is uh, at the center of the some construction companies uh, actually they are five in number uh, and they are known as the five of the you know hell and uh, they do in all Turkey all kind of destructive projects in uh, in every village and in every uh, mine and everything and on in also Istanbul we now have two important mega projects uh, destructing all the green belt uh, at the northern part of Istanbul and after Gezi in December uh, of 20 yeah 2013 at the end of that we had a certain scandal of uh, known as the 17th 24 uh, December and all these uh, recordings came out that how these five uh, took the I mean financial resources and they made a pool together and they used this in order this became a very big issue in terms of you know uh, street protests and demonstrations so after some time uh, when the uh, anti gezi uh, backlash started mm -hmm. now they use it uh, i mean if you just talk about this corruption thing that you are a part of the so-called coup d'etat. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, these are very much complicated things, but I think this is, I mean, how there's a financial, I'm um, deregulated financial resource is being shared and tried to be uh, uh, used reinforcing the political control in terms of media control. And now in Turkey, we don't have any oppositional media open now. Right. And this is what I wanted internet. to ask you about, is yeah. since, since the coup d'etat, obviously the things yeah, have yeah. advanced and there seems to be a, quite a strong crackdown uh, on all forms of, of activism. And just to stay with you for a moment, I wanted to ask what strategies are possible uh, in this new kind of highly authoritarian moment? Now, first we just, uh, I mean, we, the first step is that we tell this, um, we are not going to leave this country, we are going to live here and we are not going to surrender. I mean, we will fight back because it's not impossible for us women to become uh, some slaves of men. And if you are, I mean, uh, a secular or some, I mean, person, you don't want to be, uh, I mean, the, I, you don't want to be uh, imposed by this religious kind of um, still. If you are a laborer, you don't want to die in the mines. And so at least we try to, uh, we try to create the courage of being uh, and resisting because, uh, you know, uh, they are bombing us in the peaceful meetings and now this is unbelievable in Turkey that every day something happens. And the second one is that we try to find uh, a kind of, you know, uh, popular and democratic uh, mass movement. Uh, which, which is including the demands of the women, the cities, the urban per people, the people who try to defend their life sources and labor. So, I mean, the political issues and the most daily issues, what you were talking, uh, they are in evident. Uh, I mean, it is, uh, we have to put them together and politicize the actually the daily rights of the people. Sure, sure. Look, a common question to all of you is, is that in a situation where many of the countries are not only captured, but seem to be kind of stuck, um, um, which way do you think people are turning? How, how, how is this situation of, um, as you said, always becoming a state, but never kind of arriving? How is that affecting the mentality of people when they look at the different options available? Maybe Una, you want to have a go at that? Well. I think Kosovo is again an interesting example of this aspect because 
it has its state legitimacy is entirely tied to its international support. And, um, and so this was for, for a very long time the, and remains uh, the only uh, alternative that's, that's on the table for people because anything else would mean a loss of statehood, not that that's a viable option, but people are constantly, when they do, uh, pick uh, uh, vote for for political elites that are on the EU accession integration path, who might be corrupt. Let's say it's because they know that this is the the least, the less lesser of the evils. Um, that the other option could be going back to a state of even more instability and less uh, and, and less sort of less of a functioning society. Um, it it is. It's become harder and harder, uh, and this is what I've seen both in Kosovo and in the region, um, to see, to keep people on an EU accession path or an EU integration path or an enlargement path that they, the countries are involved in um, because they see it as, they see the EU as these overlords who are, uh, who are setting, constantly setting new uh, sort of um, requests, put, putting new requests on the table that require more and more sacrifices um, and reforms, yet seeing so many, so little benefits being reaped from it. And this is, uh, um, of course, political processes are not short term. They, some of them are very long term. But it's it's difficult for uh, for uh, uh, for society or for di for the respective societies in the Western Balkans to be uh, um, to s to stay on this path um, without seeing their lives getting better. Now in Kosovo, Co Kosovo is very interesting because it doesn't. Other than, for example, uh, certain relations with maybe Turkey or, or, or Albania, a neighboring country, which which share which most Kosovars share the most cultural uh, similarities with, um, Kosovo does not have, um, other than the United States and, and the European Union, does not have a strong Eastern ally, but Serbia does, and Serbia, Kosovo and Serbia are, are tied in political process now, and. Um, uh, most people who, again, wouldn't vote for these political elites do end up supporting them because if they're not in power, um, politicians might come in power or Serbia might might reap more, um, be more in control of Kosovo and then set a, on a path of like being more aligned with, say, um, Russia and its and its allies. And this is a situ uh, but a situation where the population is in constant fear of a much worse uh, out of a much worse future is not one where progressive policies are built, because then the population is people are too afraid to go out and protest, or uh, because they might lose their jobs or the little minimum stability that they have achieved. And um, we will not see uh, massive uh, p political changes, revolutions without sort of the uh, revolutions in the sense of like uh, radical shifts in power. Um, Colorful yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> colorful ones. Um, we, we might not see that until people understand that they are the ones who are shaping their future without any cliches. I know this, this is something that is said a lot, but they are the ones who get to vote for another political party and taking certain risks in bringing new people in power might reap long-term benefits. Following up on this, I mean, Serbia and part of Bosnia and Herzegovina, dominated by Serbs, are basically the only place in the wider region where there is a legitimate political expression of affiliation with, uh, with Russia, with China, with Eastern type of, um, say, governing. Um, and that is something that has been creating a lot of turmoil um, around the region because uh, Serbian government has been dancing this dance on a very thin line yeah. um, between the two. Uh, for some reason, they, they try to explain inexplicable, and that is that you can do both, that you can be both affiliated to Russia and the NATO, that you can be both striving to enter the European Union and adopt the European values while simultaneously acknowledging Putin's um, governance model. Um, and those um, affiliations, I would say, spill over to um, generally regional, uh, regional relations, to internal dynamics in Bosnia and Herzegovina, to Serbia-Kosovo relations, to internal politics in Kosovo. These things do spill over. And to follow up on what Una said, it's not only taking our own destiny in our hands as citizens, it's also for the political parties um, and for the political elites to understand that this, these affiliations are maybe not that much necessary. I mean, we would benefit much, much more if our affiliation was 
our own uh, rather than a uh, worldly one. Ron, maybe a, a closing question to you about this politics of fear. Um, you know, it's something that um, is being talked about throughout the, the Western world right at the moment, a kind of politics of fear. And maybe here in Kosovo, um, there's more familiarity with that uh, feeling than, <coughs> than, than in other parts of, of the world. And so maybe you, you have some messages about what it takes to mobilize people in that kind of context, the ways in which strategies of fear of the population can perhaps be overcome or combated. I feel that people in Kosovo are confused all the time. Uh, let's ha to strengthen what Una said before, Kosovo is regularly in the agenda of Security Council because on, you know every three months we have ambassadors of every state in the world talking about Kosovo, knowing or without knowing anything about Kosovo. They just, I don't know how do they get these kind of letters from where some states that support Serbia got taken. They have like very, you know, everyday life information for a small protest that I maybe I didn't hear. <laughs> you know, we are totally in this, how to say, we are part of this a big brother watching mm -hmm. us all the time. <laughs> and of course, we're just a state of two million people. And Barely. everybody knows that, you know, and we know that we are not important. And we know how it, it was before 1999. It's fresh, that threat, and that now is represented by Vucic, who was minister of uh, uh, censorship, or how was it called, information at that time. Dacic was spokesperson of Milosevic. You know, and they, they always say that we are going to come back in Kosovo. And we know how that coming back is, you know. People know that. Maybe uh, my brother's generation who, uh, uh, who was born after 1999, he doesn't, he's not affiliated physically, but he also inherited our memory of war and stuff like this. So I think that this is the, the key factor that makes Kosovo uh, very calm when there is a situation that we should protest. Yeah. Uh, and one of, uh, of the issues was this stability thing. Like if you, if, you could, if you ask citizens of Kosovo, what do you think about whatever, something stability, their uh, vocabulary would be very rich because in television we are bombed with stability paradigma and stuff like this, you know, Security Council, everybody knows how to put these All the complex <laughs> phrases that sound, everybody is a ca academic if you ask them in the street, because everybody knows this kind of language. But the thing is that, and that is definitely a sign of fear. Mm. People are totally terrified. They live in a country that is still not even in UN. Mm. Uh, so, you know, we have uh, ambassadors that now, uh, that now are very careful not to appear in public as those who rule Kosovo. And I think, in my perception, last elections, they left a bit Kosovo uh, political parties to deal for six months. They couldn't achieve anything, then they intervened again. But it's also, I think, uh, that people are also feeling this, and it is being talked about this in public media, in public opinion in general, uh, about the shift of uh, international focus from Kosovo to uh, other uh, regions. So Balkans is not anymore that sexy as it used to be. Thank you. I think we're going we're gonna to leave it there uh, for this issue of Talk Real. But obviously what we're trying to do is uh, not enrich the vocabulary of stability, but try and generate a vocabulary <laughs> of change, a new vocabulary of change. Uh, and hopefully you'll join us on another episode of Talk Real to help us in that.